It's my pleasure to welcome you all today to the closing plenary of our conference on the invasion of Iraq regional reflections. My name is Eddie Kola, and I'm a history professor here at Georgetown in Qatar. And as I said, I have the real honor of chairing a panel here with some serious academic star power. And I know we academics like to say that a lot. There's a famous historian or a famous this or that, but this is really a, a really superb panel of both expertise and um, uh, I hope really excellent commentary to bring our conference to a close. This panel is called U.S. Foreign Policy Towards the Region, the Bush Presidency and Beyond. And so one thing we're going to be looking at today is the various ways that regional actors have had their perceptions and their reactions to U.S. foreign policy impacted since the time of the invasion of Iraq. We're going to discuss various things like lessons learned um, by critically analyzing U.S. activities in this region and how uh, U.S. policy in this region will be moving forward in the future. But there's, there's a second aim to this panel, which is really to reflect on the conference as a whole and perhaps bring out some of the most pertinent discussions that have been going on both in panels but also uh, in discussions over meals or coffee breaks or elsewhere. So let me turn now to introducing our panelists. Immediately next to me is Juan Cole, who is the Richard P. Mitchell Collegiate Professor of History at the University of Michigan. And he's also a specialist on the modern Middle East and South Asia. He's public, excuse me, published extensively and uh, was the editor of various academic journals like the International Journal of Middle Eastern Studies. But he has achieved something that most academics can only dream of, and he's best known, I think, for his blog, which is called Informed Comment. Next to Juan is Flint Leverett, who is Professor of International Affairs and Asian Studies, and indeed was part of the founding faculty of the Penn State School of International Affairs. He is an expert in the Middle East, energy and economic dimensions of international security, and Chinese foreign policy. And before joining academia, he had a career, a, a long-standing and distinguished career in US, for, uh, US service, uh, working with the CIA, the State Department, and the National Security Council. Next, we have Trita Parsi, who is an expert on US-Iranian foreign relations, Iranian foreign policy, and the geopolitics of the Middle East. He's authored a number of books on US foreign policy in the Middle East, uh, with a particular focus on both Iran and also Israel. He served as an adjunct professor at too many different international relations schools to mention, and he is currently the executive vice president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, where one of our faculty colleagues recently left to join you, Anatole Levin. Last, we have Randa Sleem, who is a fellow of the Foreign Policy Institute of the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. She's an expert in peace building, democratization, and post-conflict reconciliation, specifically in track two dialogues, having worked in areas such as Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon, and you know, elsewhere in the Middle East and Central Asia. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the, uh, the proverbial mic over to you, Juan. Thank you very much. How, how long do I have? Oh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Um, well, uh, let me express my gratitude to, to uh, the uh, uh, Qatar campus of the Georgetown University for this very kind invitation uh, for us to speak here. It's a great honor. And um, my remarks um, really have to do with, uh, with my estimation of the changing motivations for US foreign policy towards this region uh, including Iraq. Um, and I warn you that I can't completely prove what I'm going to say because uh, we don't have the internal memos. Uh, we were uh, earlier in the conference, we saw the uh, persistent questioning of the US ambassador and the UK ambassador as to why the United States invaded Iraq in the first place, and they admitted that they didn't know. Uh, and um, that's really quite remarkable, uh, because if anybody knew, surely it would be the U.S. ambassador. Uh, and I had this experience early on. In 2004, 
because I, uh, I had written about Iraq. I, I was uh, viewed as an Iraq expert in Washington, and I was called to con consult with some congressmen. And one of the congressmen who was there, was, was a Republican actually, was very attentive to what I had to say. But afterwards kind of drew me aside and said, Professor Cole, why do you think we're, we, we went into Iraq? And I, I was astounded. I thought to myself, I'm a Midwestern college professor. You're the US government. You tell me why we went into Iraq. Uh, but clearly the Bush administration didn't tell the congressmen, including those of its own party, uh, why they did this. Um, I think it's about oil. I don't think it was in a kind of simplistic uh, narrative of uh, uh, war for oil, but I think uh, Dick, Dick Cheney, the vice president who made a lot of the policy, uh, had been head of Halliburton. And in the late 90s, I think the US uh, oil firms were very concerned uh, about two things. One was that they were finding fewer and fewer uh, big fields every decade. Uh, and there was prospect of peak oil. Uh, and uh, the other thing they were afraid of was, was um, uh, the, the, that the climate crisis was being realized by the scientists. And there was beginning to be public uh, concern about the burning of fossil fuels and greater attention to the possibility of switching to solar and wind and other renewable forms of energy. And I think uh, the Iraq war was intended to solve both of those problems in the medium term. Uh, I think Cheney looked around for oil fields. Well, Iraq has oceans of oil underneath of it, and we all knew this, but they couldn't get at it because of sanctions. And I think he concluded that if he did regime change, then the sanctions would fall, which is what happened. And now Iraq is pumping, I don't know, four and a half million barrels a day, uh, which makes a big difference in the world price. And I, th I think Cheney got what he wanted uh, in the end. Um, but ironically enough, uh, this crunch in the, uh, in the discovery of new fields and for the US oil companies uh, was resolved in a different way uh, by about 2006, the back and field had come on line in the United States. The U.S. had been producing less and less petroleum of its own, but then it, they started fracking. They started using hydraulic fracturing, uh, and they got back up to producing, well, between petroleum and other liquid forms of hydrocarbons, well, something on the order of 12 million barrels a day, which is, you know, more than the Saudis are doing. So. Um, by the time you get into the Obama administration, finding new sources of petroleum is not on anyone's mind. Uh, and moreover, Obama didn't come from that sector of US economy that was worried about this, as, as Bush and Cheney had been. Uh, and I think for Obama, having been from Hawaii, uh, uh, the Pacific Rim loomed much larger than the Middle East. And if you think about it, the total trade between the United States and the Pacific Rim, uh, bilateral trade, is something on the order of a trillion and a half a year uh, of dollars. And um, the US trade with the Middle East is much smaller, uh, and uh, smaller yet today, I suspect, than it was in Obama's time. Uh, and so Obama, uh, being from the Pacific Rim, looked out and thought China is rising and we should rebalance towards, uh, towards Asia. And uh, the Middle East seemed to him not very important because we now had our own sources of petroleum through fracking. Uh, and uh, uh, moreover, the Iraq war had turned into a quagmire. Uh, he was drawn into the Libyan misadventure uh, uh, for concerns about the welfare of the Libyan people, I think, uh, on the part of some of his staffers, uh, but he called it a, a shit sandwich uh, and clearly was very unhappy about being drawn into it. Uh, and so he was trying to move this behemoth of the U.S. government towards, towards East Asia in its concerns and away from the Middle East. 
And I think the uh, nuclear uh, deal he did with, uh, he and the Security Council did with Iran was part of his farewell to the region. He thought, and he said this in an interview in The Atlantic, that the U.S. should turn to offshore balancing as a way of dealing with the region. Let the uh, Arab countries and Iran work it out between them. And in the meantime, we're going off and being concerned about security in the Philippines and uh, Japan and East Asia more generally regarding the, the rise of China. Um, and, uh, and so the, the failure of the Iraq war and um, a different kind of resolution of, of the U.S. energy crisis uh, allowed Obama to, to strike out in this direction. Uh, and then Trump comes in, and from his point of view, uh, the Middle East is still a security issue, uh, and I think he felt that the nuclear deal with Iran left too many outstanding bilateral issues on the table. Uh, the U.S. didn't want Iran in, 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 in Syria, didn't want Iran in Iraq, um, agreed with the, with the uh, GCC that, uh, that the Houthis in uh, the Ansarullah in, in Yemen were Iranian proxies. Uh, and uh, so Trump was enlisted uh, by US, U.S. Um, allies in the region, including uh, Israel's Netanyahu, into reversing the Iran nuclear deal, drawing, uh, pulling out of it and then slapping very hard sanctions on Iran, what we call maximum pressure campaign. I think the most severe uh, financial and trade embargo on any country that has ever been put in peacetime uh, un until the, the recent set of sanctions on, on Russia uh, over the Ukraine war. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, that caused a lot of trouble. And the U.S., I think, joined in this campaign to roll back Iran in the region. Uh, U.S. allies were unhappy, uh, both uh, the GCC and Israel with uh, with Hezbollah in Lebanon as an Iran, Iranian proxy, uh, with Iran's dominating position in, in Syria, having won the civil war uh, with Russian help, uh, Iran's continuing strong influence in Iraq, and, uh, and, and the rise of the Houthis in Yemen. Um, all of those campaigns failed miserably, uh, and this was clear by the time President Biden came in. Uh, so that even the GCC countries and, and Saudi Arabia and the UAE in particular uh, began rethinking, uh, reestablishing relationships with uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad in Syria, uh, giving up the attempt to dislodge Hezbollah from Lebanon, uh, and uh, beginning the process of uh, rapprochement with, uh, with Iraq and, and uh, uh, pursuing uh, peace with, uh, with Yemen. Uh, and uh, I think that was kind of the stage in which the Biden administration came in. And then I think, just to finish up, that the Biden administration era has been one that promises a new relationship of the United States with the Middle East and a much diminished role for the, for the Middle East over time. Uh, and this is for a number of reasons. The Inflation Reduction Act that uh, was passed under Biden uh, uh, has $369 billion in it for the green energy transition. Uh, there's a, a $7,500 tax rebate for buying an electric car. I got one. And um, uh, the number of new registrations of electric cars is uh, going up really exponentially every year in Germany, uh, now in the United States. Uh, I think in 10 years, uh, the demand from the industrial world for uh, petroleum for transportation will be much reduced. And over time, I think this promises, this, this energy translation, transition promises a much diminished concern of the United States for the Middle East. And I think Obama's initial instinct that the action is out there in, in the Pacific is, is going to be followed upon uh, over time. And of course now, 
with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Eastern Europe is back in play. I think the U.S. has put all of its marbles in those baskets, and there won't be very much attention left over for the region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Uh, I realize that I failed one of my most important duties as chair of this panel, which is to remind you all, please, if you have questions for our panelists, to use the uh, QR codes which are on uh, your tables. Please send your questions there with your name as well as your affiliation, and we'll be getting to the Q&A uh, after all the speakers have had their opening remarks. Next up, please, we have Flint Leppert. Thank you, Eddie. Um, this has been a spectacularly rich conference. I'm very happy to have had the chance to be part of it, and I thank Georgetown for the invitation. I'm going to boil my observations about the U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq and subsequent trajectory of U.S. policy in the Middle East down to three points. I hope that'll be manageable. Um, before I offer my points, I'll offer a kind of personal note. Um, Professor Cola alluded in introducing me to my uh, time in government service before I became an academic. I did spend uh, 11 years working on Middle East issues in the US government. The last job that I had uh, doing that was um, I was senior director for Middle East affairs at the National Security Council at the White House um, in the run-up to the U.S. invasion of Iraq. I left the White House, left my position at the White House, and began the process of leaving government service about uh, two weeks before the United States invaded Iraq. The timing of my departure from the White House wasn't coincidental. Um, I wish I could say in retrospect I had opposed the Iraq War in principle. That wouldn't quite be honest. I thought, to borrow a quote, um, I think mistakenly attributed to a revolutionary French diplomat named Talleyrand, I thought it was going to be worse than a crime. It would be a mistake. Um, at this point, in my life, I still think it was a mistake. If anything, I underestimated just how self-damaging the war would be to the United States. Um, I also think, for whatever it's worth, um, I think it was a crime, too. Um, and those observations uh, color my, um, my analysis of the issues I'm going to be talking about. And so I will just state that at the outset. Three points. The first one, the US invasion and occupation of Iraq is, and this name has been mentioned in a previous presentation, it's a textbook case of what historian Paul Kennedy famously called imperial overstretch. And it's a case of imperial overstretch that has had profoundly negative ramifications for the United States' strategic standing here in the Middle East and, indeed, globally. The US invasion and occupation of Iraq, in my view, was a sadly natural outgrowth of a particular US strategic agenda for the Middle East, an agenda embraced by Democratic as well as Republican administrations for decades. In a nutshell, that agenda is to build up and consolidate a highly militarized US-led political and security order in the region and to ostracize and eventually undermine political orders in the region unwilling to subordinate their strategic independence to such a project. American policymakers have wanted to pursue this kind of strategic agenda in the Middle East, really from the end of World War II. The Cold War actually constrained the United States in significant ways from pursuing this agenda. 
It wasn't until the coincidence of the Cold War's end with the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990 that the United States had a serious opening to pursue this agenda in a relatively unconstrained way. And while it was a Republican administration, the George H.W. Bush administration, that started pursuing this agenda as an extension of its prosecution of the first Persian Gulf War, the Clinton administration fulsomely embraced the project of forging a highly militarized US-led regional order in the Middle East after it displaced the George H.W. Bush administration from power in Washington. On this point, I would note, as a matter of historical fact, that President George W. Bush was not the first U.S. president to make regime change the ultimate goal of U.S. policy toward Iraq. That distinction belongs to President Bill Clinton, who made regime change the goal of U.S.-Iraq policy when he signed the so-called Iraq Liberation Act into law in 1998. After 9-11, the United States doubled down on this strategic agenda in the Middle East. It was to advance this agenda that the George W. Bush administration decided to invade and occupy Iraq. The Iraq War, at its core, was not about WMD. It certainly wasn't about counterterrorism. The war was about America's ambition to be the Middle East's extra-regional hegemon. That ambition enjoyed deep and bipartisan support in the United States, but it was also fundamentally and dangerously detached from political, military, social, and economic reality. And that's why the United States lost not just its war in Iraq, but its war in Afghanistan, too. That gets me to my second point. Um, the US invasion and occupation of Iraq is a case of imperial overstretch from which the United States is nowhere close to recovering. In previous discussions here, it's been noted correctly that Barack Obama and Donald Trump both campaigned for their party's presidential nominations on foreign policy platforms that appeared to challenge core elements of the established US strategic agenda in the Middle East. Obama said he wanted to end not just the war in Iraq, but he wanted to end the mindset that had gotten America into the Iraq war in the first place. Trump was likewise sharply critical of the Iraq war. He was also very critical of Obama's intervention in Libya and proposals for US intervention in Syria. We can discuss this more in the Q&A if you like, but I'm at least going to assert for now that during their presidential tenures, neither Obama nor Trump made any appreciable and lasting progress toward changing the mindset that produced the invasion and occupation of Iraq, the disastrous US intervention in Libya, fatally self-limited, bound to fail approaches to US diplomatic interaction with Iran, and the death, which too few are yet willing to acknowledge, the death of the two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. As for President Biden, I think it would be detached from analytic reality to expect an octogenarian politician who has spent much of his decades-long political career codifying conventional wisdom on US foreign policy, to expect that politician to be an agent of profound change in US Middle East strategy. Indeed, I would argue that the decline in America's ability 
to achieve its own stated goals, self-defined goals in the Middle East, um, a decline already observable under George W. Bush, which gained further momentum under President Obama and President Trump, that decline, I would argue, is now accelerating under President Biden. That gets me to my last point. Until the United States truly recasts its grand strategic agenda in the Middle East, its influence in the region will continue to decline. U.S. Middle East policy is less and less relevant to the strategic agendas and interests of regional states. The security cooperation that the United States offers its ostensible allies in the region is perceived by those allies as less reliable than it used to be, less valuable than it used to be, and more burdened with onerous, don't do business with Huawei sorts of accompanying demands by Washington. President Biden is in effect trying to sell blackberries, remember blackberries, <laughs> trying to sell blackberries in an iPhone and smartphone world. Um, no wonder it's not working very well. Um, no wonder President Biden's trip to Saudi Arabia last year was, um, first of all, somebody who used to prepare presidential visits. It was the single worst prepared uh, foreign visit by an American president I have ever personally watched. It was also the most embarrassing um, this overseas trip by an American president that I have ever watched. And until the United States is prepared to recast its strategic agenda in the region, that's not gonna get better. I hope I am wrong in just about everything that I just said, but um, I don't think I'm wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Flint. Next up, we have Trita Parsi. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you. It's a great honor to be here at uh, George Wa Georgetown University Doha, as well as with Juan, with Flint, and with Rhonda, and with all of you. I fear that Flint is right. I don't think that he is wrong. Let me build a little bit on what he has said. If we take a look at what the Biden administration has said that its vision is, for the Middle East. The formulation that has been used is that we are going to go back to basics. And back to basics means no more excessive regime change efforts, no more ambitious plans to transform the region, but instead focusing on alliances uh, and alliance building and a much more humble foreign policy. On the surface, that sounds probably quite good if, of course, that is what is being pursued. I fear that it is not, but also more importantly, as Flint pointed out, the basics of America's policy to the region is what has been the problem, not the excesses alone. Because the basics has been exactly as what Flint said, a policy of military domination, which is sought as an organizing principle to organize the region against certain countries during various times. In the 1990s, the organization was against Iraq and Iran during, uh, as part of the dual containment policy. After the Iraq war, the focus was much more on Iran and secondarily on Syria. The only brief period is arguably during about a year and a half of Obama administration's reign in which was trying to shift a little bit away from that, but then we've gone back to that again. Now, the reason why I think this is particularly problematic right now is because, ironically, not as a result of a change of mindset, again, I think Flint is right here, but because of political constraints that have emerged as a result of the American public's fatigue 
with wars in the Middle East. The ability to sustain that level of military commitment to the region is simply not there. And I think the region has gone through three phases when it comes to this key issue. The first phase is when the United States was telling regional actors the U.S. is going to pivot to Asia. And it appears that no one in the region believed the United States. Then the attacks by the Iranians against Saudi Arabia in 2019 happened. Trump didn't act. Attacks by the Houthis against Abu Dhabi in 2021. Biden didn't act. And things seemed to have flipped. Now suddenly, the region was quite convinced that even if the United States is not leaving the region physically, it has lost the will to fight for and in the region. And this ironically happened at a time when competition with China was becoming the core uh, uh, thing on the American mind. And as a result, the American message to the region was, we're not leaving. But then the region was now not believing it when it said that. Whereas before, the issue was that when it said that it's staying, the region didn't believe it. I think we have now entered the third phase, in which after first, a lot of anger and frustration, a sense of betrayal, that the United States is no longer reliable, it is no longer the ally that many uh, governments in the region thought that it was. It seems to me that the region has now reached uh, a degree of confidence, discovering its own agency, recognizing that now it can actually chart its own path, its own future, without having to check everything with Washington. And that this is now a situation in which the American withdrawal in that sense is somewhat welcomed, at least in certain corners, and I'm talking about states that are still very close friends and allies of the United States. But the frustration now is that the U.S. is trying to force these countries to choose between the United States and China. In all of this, something else is happening that, in my view, truly goes to show that back to basics is really an insufficient formula. And that is the effort right now by the Biden administration, I would argue its absolute top priority, to seek a normalization deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Again, a matter that on its surface probably doesn't sound too bad. It wouldn't be a bad thing at all if there could be greater diplomacy and dialogue in the region. But it's coming at a time when the region, as part of this renewed uh, discovery of its agency, and very much as a result of a realization that the United States is not going to be reliable as a security partner, that that has dramatically changed the incentive structures of many governments in the region. Suddenly, pursuing diplomacy and reducing tensions with neighbors became far more attractive and necessary than what it was when there was a sense that regional states could hide behind American power. In that sense, ironically, America's military uh, domination of the region may very well have served as an obstacle to the region pursuing its own that diplomacy and conflict resolution. And we've seen that now with both the intra-Arab detente as well as a detente between uh, Turkey, uh, Iran, and other non-Arab states in the region. Two models seem to have been emerging. One is the Abrams Accord, which very much at its core goes back to the principle of organizing the region against, in this case, again, Iran. Just take a look at Jared Kushner's document and very explicitly not only says that this is targeting Iran, but also says that any improvement of relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia or other Arab states is a challenge to the Abrams Accord. Meaning, for the Abrams Accords to be able to be achieved, tensions between Arab states and Iran need to be there and they need to be sustained. If they reduce, they actually undermine the very foundation of the uh, Abrams Accord. The alternative is exactly what the Iraqi government has presented with the Baghdad Dialogue, which has played a significant role in the intra-regional and intra-Arab detente that we have seen. If you take a look at them, they differ in three significant ways. One is not seeking to organize the region against anyone. It's inclusive. The other one, again, goes back to that formula of trying to sustain American dominance through such an organization. Secondly, one is not targeting any other country. It is inclusive for all, and is not. It's more of a collective security uh, um, uh, conversation rather than a security pact that divides the region into blocks. And one is actually coming from the region itself, while the other one is a plan that was first put together in Washington, D.C. I think because of this opportunity that the region now has, 
to be able to further move down the path of intra-regional detente. Any movement towards such an agreement that is based on the, the um, details that have emerged, which is a security agreement, a security guarantee by the United States, very well risks pushing the region in the opposite direction of this intra-regional uh, diplomacy and dialogue and back to what we have seen, the very basics of American foreign policy for the last couple of decades. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Trita. I'm quite struck by how you began saying you agreed so much with Flint, but whereas Flint's prognosis was quite pessimistic, yours is quite hopeful, and I find that, you know, telling, and we'll come back to that when we have uh, time for discussion. I want to, though, turn the floor now to our final panelist, Randa Sleem, for her um, comments, please. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Georgetown, for the invitation. Thank you, Dean Masri. Thank you, Dr. Zahra Babar, for hosting us at this really excellent conference. Uh, you have been very gracious host, and I think I personally speak for myself and many of my colleagues who came here from abroad have, um, you know, have had the same experience. Thank you again. Uh, let me start by basically stating the obvious here. I'm the last speaker on the last panel on the last day of this conference. So how much can I add to what has been said? I started with like two, three sheets of talking points. I'm down to one sheet of talking points. And I'm going to approach this topic from a different perspective. Uh, and I think each one of us read the title and what the session was supposed to do differently, although I think there is a little bit more convergence between Flint and uh, Trita. Um, I, I looked at it as trying to look at the Iraq war um, and lessons that America took from the Iraq war and how it impacted its interventions or its thinking about interventions, especially with the Obama administration, with the Arab Spring in Syria and Libya, which I'm going to talk about. And then what has been the impact of the Iraq war, both domestically inside the United States, but also globally in terms of what uh, many have already spoken. Uh, in terms of democracy agenda. Uh, on a personal note, let me say that when I started my academic career as a an Arab Lebanese woman who went to the States to study for her PhD, I decided on purpose not to do Arab studies. I said, I want to push myself outside my comfort zone. And so what I focused mostly on peace processes, but also peace processes in Latin America. I worked on US-Russia relations, on transitions from authoritarian to democracy in uh, the East, East Europe. 9-11 was a wake-up call for me as an Arab American. Um, and basically, it forced me to go back to the Middle East. And this is when I start working on the Middle East again. At the time, I was affiliated with the Kettering Foundation, which ran the oldest US-Soviet, then US-Russian track 1.5 dialogue um, that was started by President Eisenhower and um, Premier Khrushchev in the 60s, in the midst of the Cold War, just to identify ways for the two peoples to talk with each other. And so we had tracks involving actors speaking with each other. Martha Graham took part, for example, before I joined the Gathering Foundation in one of the conversations. Uh, we had, uh, you know, as well as armed controls experts talking with each other. Most of the Russians who basically became part of the Glasnost, Perestroika movement working with um, uh, Gorbachev later on, were pretty much, to the person, graduates of the Dartmouth Conference. And it's called the Dartmouth Conference because it, the first meeting was held in Dartmouth College. So 
Come 9-11, I decided that I needed to work on the region. And one of the projects eventually I became involved in uh, between the years 2006-2009, uh, I and few others of my colleagues, one Italian, two Brits, uh, one Brit, two Americans, uh, we convened a track 1.5 dialogue process on national reconciliation in Iraq, 2006 to 2009. It involved Iraqi political leaders, mostly parliamentarians, many of whom, some of whom, in fact, many of whom became either prime ministers or ministers later on. Uh, and, uh, and uh, tribal leaders. We also had a separate track with uh, leaders of Sunni insurgent groups. And so we were working on these two tracks. And uh, no surprise to anybody in this room, I think, to learn that this project failed. You know, by 2009, we folded it, uh, primarily because we were working on um, a legal framework to in a way, amend the debatification uh, order and the debatification pro process and working on transitional justice. And uh, at the time, Nouri al-Maliki, I mean, after we have worked for a number of years on this, Nouri al-Maliki came out in opposition. He was a prime minister at the time, and that was the end of the project. And we realized as long as he was in power, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, so, you know, I've seen Iraq in the bad days. My first trip was 2008, but I've also recently seen Iraq in as late as 2010. I mean, sorry, as late as June, uh, last, this last June. I was back in the country. And, uh, you know, what, what struck me is, is, is the fact that you have lots of building cranes everywhere around Baghdad. You have, you know, people out in the streets in places where in 2008 there were nobody out in the streets. Uh, so, but still there is a lot of sadness and there is also creeping hopelessness about the future of the country. However, you know, lessons from other countries like Iraq that have gone through decades of war, they usually survive and they come to see, you know, the other somehow page um, um, in their history. Uh, I don't know if anybody mentioned in this room, as well as in the other, other dialogue rooms, the future of Iraq project, which was started in, what, a month after 9-11? Uh, October 2001, right? Uh, uh, and um, and it's, a, it, it's, an, I mean, it's a project that was started by the State Department at the time, uh, brought about 200 Iraqis from the Iraqi exile community uh, and, you know, together in like 33 meetings over a period of a year and a half to discuss basically the transition after the fall of the Saddam Hussein regime. Remember, this was October 2001. Now, if you, read, if you look at the memos, which by the way are all present, I mean, there is a volume of 13 volume, 1200 pages. Of, of this document. They are now available uh, on the National Security Archives. And if you go through them, I mean, they discussed everything. They discussed a lot of the scenarios that happened and unfolded in Iraq. And, and unfortunately, none of it was taken up by the Defense Department, which led the invasion and eventually took over the post-invasion planning. And interestingly, a lot of the scenarios that unfolded through right in the post-Iraq invasion, basically were already you know, mentioned and discussed in, 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 these, uh, in this project. And so um, one thing that, you know, another thing to add to this is that building on what Ambassador Wilkes said, is that the United States went into this war um, uh, when Iraq was already a black box for their intelligence agencies. I remember, I remember one former Assistant Secretary of State for the Near East telling me, we invaded a country we, we, we knew least about. So maybe I'm, not, I'm going to be cynical here after the presentation. You should not invade a country you know least about. In addition to you should not invade a country at all. Uh, so what are the major lessons that policymakers took from the Iraq war? And, and uh, especially 
with the, starting with the Obama administrations. Um, I, think, I think one lesson that President Obama himself um, came in with uh, is, um, as Flynn said, he voted, I mean, he, he campaigned on, 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 on ending um, the forever wars uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and he came into, into, into office basically, you know, thinking that if an intervention needs to happen, and eventually he had to approve a couple of interventions later, uh, it, has, it has to have a, a, a UN mandate, you know, at best, and it has to have approval of Congress, and it has, uh, you know, uh, it has to, to have a certain timeline, a certain time limit in terms of, and, and a specific objective. And that very much uh, colors and colored his approach to Syria. Uh, if you remember with uh, Syria, uh, uh, in 2013, uh, despite the fact that, uh, you know, everybody was pleading with him to go into Syria, everybody expected him to go into Syria, although it was a limited attack at the time as was planned, he recalled at the last minute, and primarily for two reasons. One, it was not UN sanctioned, it was in violation of international law. And at the se second, it was not approved by Congress. This was the time, as Rita said and many said, the US public was already tired of the Iraq war and tired of intervention in the Middle East. If you look at Libya, Libya is very much an embodiment of these principles that, that Obama came with. It was a NATO-led intervention. It was a short duration, you know, seven months long. And it ended with achieving the objective of overthrowing Gaddafi. But both of them, whether it's the Iraq war or the Libya intervention, they have different characteristics. They were guided by different principles. In one case, U.S. forces came, stayed in the country, you know, and, and, and basically occupied the country for a long time. In the other case, United States, you know, the, the, object, the objective was achieved, but then there were no boots on the ground after that to guide the post-invasion stage. Yet in both, uh, in a way, the mess, you know, happened after, uh, after the war. And, uh, uh, which brings me to uh, my, uh, my, my second point or my second lesson learned uh, from uh, the Iraq war, uh, which might be, um, you know, controversial for some in the room, is that, and that's based on conversation I've had with U.S. officials who have participated in the litigation of the Iraq war, uh, on the ground as diplomats and who have, uh, you know, um, worked through so many years in Iraq. Um, and, and, and one of the lessons learned from them, which I think affected uh, the way also he approached uh, Libya, but also the way he approached Syria, but also eventually how Biden approached recently Iran, is that exile groups are not usually trustworthy partners. Uh, in any kind of intervention. I mean, one lesson learned from the Iraq uh, uh, war, the partners that the Bush administration rely, relied on, Iraqis, were mostly, you know, in fact, all of them were Iraqi exile groups. Uh, and soon, US diplomats found out, once they were on the ground, they had limited influence on the ground, they did not know the dynamics of the country, they have been away from the country for a long time. That colored very much how Obama approached Libyan exiles, you know. That colored very much how Obama approached Syrian exiles uh, in, 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 in Washington. But also it colored Biden recently, how, because a lot of the Obama officials are very much part of the Biden administration official. It also colored how they approached Iranian exiles, especially anti-regime Iranian exiles. Uh, another lesson uh, uh, which I know I think you guys said that uh, uh, Obama came uh, with, uh, w you know, one thing to, I mean, or left, or w different perception. But remember, the Middle East pulled Obama back in 2014 with the ISIS invasion. I mean, in 2011, we were out, and that 
negotiation between the Americans and the Iraqis happened during the lat latter years of the Bush administration, and it was picked up by the Obama administration. But, and, and between 2009 2010, we had the pivot to Asia, you know, and I think Juan has a good interpretation of what drove Obama in, in, in his pivot to Asia. But by 2014, in a way, my colleague uh, uh, Brian Katulis calls it Obama's Michael Corleone's moment. Uh, if you remember the Godfather movie, you know, at one point Michael Corleone says uh, in talking about the mob, you know, at some point you think you are leaving and then they pull you in. And that's how Obama felt in 2014. In 2009, 2010, 2011, we are out. And then 2014, you had the ISIS. In fact, it started 2013. The ISIS, you know, uh, uh, in, two, in, in, in Syria, and then in Mosul, of course, in June 2014, and he had to be pulled in. Uh, at, at that time, Obama felt that the threat that ISIS represented met the kind of threat threshold that warranted military intervention. Whereas, for example, uh, Assad regime did not meet that kind of threat threshold. Even after the gassing in Ghouta in 2013, still he did not feel that that regime met the threat threshold to warrant a military intervention, as well as because of the reasons that I have uh, mentioned. And so the pivot, you know, started with Obama. It was, he was pulled back in the Middle East. Trump picked it up again, you know. Uh, it very much, as Flynn said, he campaigned on, you know, opposition to the Iraq war. He campaigned against Clinton on her vote for the Iraq war. He campaigned against Clinton on her role in the Obama administration and uh, the lack of credibility that, uh, you know, um, that Obama's policies caused for us uh, in, in, in the region, he came in the world. He campaigned against uh, uh, Clinton on the Benghazi, uh, you know, uh, consulate attack. Uh, and, 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 and that message appealed to um, you know, a good part of the American electorate that felt on one hand tired of, uh, of the wars in the Middle East, that felt that basically the Middle East is a losing proposition for us, you know, nothing but death and, and blood, and, and, and that felt that the wars in the Middle East distracted attention and resources away from home away from, uh, their, from securing them jobs, away from uh, 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 spending on infrastructure, away from tackling important issues like climate change. Uh, and that was both on the right and on the left. And, and, uh, um, and, 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 and Trump won on that message of, you know, America, you know, making America great again and America comes first. Uh, uh, his approach to the Middle East was very much transactional. I mean, you had a 2017 national security strategy, which basically was written by his national security advisor and their staffers. But Obama never bought into that. Uh, I, mean, uh, by, I mean, Trump never bought into that. Uh, and, and, and he was more interested in how much, how much weapons we are selling, you know, that famous meeting between him and MBS showing us a picture of look how much Saudi Arabia just bought, how much money they, they just spent. So, uh, which brings me to Biden. Uh, Biden very much is a product and important, you know, of the Obama-Biden administration. He is picking up where his former boss left off, which is pivoting back to China, the strategic competition with China. And, and has had a rough time dealing with the Middle East, uh, has wanted to, has, has worked hard to avoid any kind of entanglement in the Middle East, any kind of entrapment in the Middle East. Uh, and that's why you, 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 you see his administration basically trying to, you know, work with the Israelis in order, I mean, do military exercises, but no security guarantees in terms of any potential attack on Iran. Uh, and I think uh, eventually, I think this last meeting at the G20, this IMEC corridor, I think it's one way by which the, Obama, uh, the Biden administration is approaching the Middle East, in my opinion, in a more effective way. I have, I have, I wanted to add one, one quick point about the detente and what Rita said. I'm, I'm extremely interested in how this 
Saudi-Iranian normalization, detente proceeds. First, let's say quickly, you know, put, say it up front. Uh, the, the whole negotiations were done mostly thanks to Iraqi, to Iraq and Oman. Uh, China was brought in as a superpower, not as a guarantor. I don't know how many of you have read that agreement. Not many have read the agreement, but it's literally a gentleman agreement. There are no, basically, clauses in terms of what will China do if one party violates that agreement, you know? I mean, as, as a mediator, as a guarantor, none of that. So China was brought in because Saudi Arabia primarily needed a superpower or a global power uh, to come in and, and give its blessing to this agreement. The US could not do it, it doesn't have relations with Iran. The EU is not that kind of power in the eyes of the Saudis. China was it, and it was, you know, very important in. So I have been looking, and Flint and others, I've been looking at US-Soviet detente and see how that detente materialized over time and how it got operationalized, and to see if there are lessons learned from that detente to how we can do the detente here. Because the, it's, not, it's, it's not as much a normalization yet, it's very much a detente. It's a gentleman agreement, you know, to basically, you know, dis start improving the relationship. The trust remain, the mistrust remain very high. Um, I don't see Saudi Arabia going and violating US sanctions against Iran to help Iran with its economic. I think the, the mistrust between them is too high to overcome. So if you look at the US-Soviet detente, which basically started with the Nixon administration in the late 60s, and then ended with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1980. During those times, the way it started, it really started at the personal level. It started with basically a Soviet ambassador named Dobrinin, and Kissinger, at the time, National Security Advisor and Secretary of State, talking with each other on a daily basis almost. And then eventually it led on a number of tracks, official, non-official, into a series of agreements, uh, trade agreements, uh, into uh, arms control agreement, but also more importantly, it, it enabled the Helsinki process, you know, which many people talk about it as something that could be replicated in this region. So we can talk about this in question and answer session. I stop here, I took too much of my time. No, Randa, that was terrific. Thank you so much. And uh, I, you know, I, I would put you, if we go back to my comment about the, the divide between Trita and Flint, sort of more on, on Trita's side, just because you have identified some lessons learned, potentially, from the, uh, from the Iraq uh, invasion. So we'll come back to that discussion in a second. I want to I wanna go back to our first speaker, not just because you were the first speaker, Juan, but because I was struck by your talk because it was a fantastic overview of U.S. foreign policy since the invasion. But many of the factors you describe as influencing U.S. foreign policy in that period have next to nothing to do with the invasion, right? You talked about U.S. fracking. You talk about, you know, inflation. You talk about uh, Obama's attempted pivot to Asia. And so I'm curious if, I know you're not saying that the, that the U.S. invasion of Iraq was, was unimportant, but do you see those other factors as really being what fundamentally has driven U.S. foreign policy in the past 20 years, with Iraq being very important but minor compared to some of these more longer-term and structural issues, like climate change, for example? Well, I, the argument I was trying to make was that um, I believe the decision to invade Iraq uh, was driven to some extent, and it was, there were lots of reasons for it, but to some extent uh, by the alarm in the uh, petroleum industry about the lack of new fields being discovered and the constraints that that would ultimately place on uh, the U.S. corporate uh, energy sector. Uh, and um, when, when Cheney was, in, uh, was at Halliburton, uh, he was frantically looking for new fields uh, and, and actually got a billion dollar magnetic 
imaging system to try to find them under the earth, and he never did. So um, what I was saying, what I was trying to say was that uh, during the time that the US was occupying Iraq, the hydraulic fracturing revolution took place, and we were already starting to produce a significant amount of, of US petroleum uh, and gas uh, by the end of that war. And so that by the end of the war, one of the considerations in pursuing the war was already uh, made redundant. Uh, and I think which made it easy for Obama to follow through on the pledges that Bush had made to get out of Iraq. The, 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 he wasn't getting the same kind of pressure from the American uh, corporate sector ab about uh, energy policy. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think at that point, um, the competition for markets with, with China started to uh, become more important to the US. Uh, and uh, so I, I see it as a transition. Iraq was a, it was a transition, uh, a transitionary area uh, from uh, a, a little bit of a hysteria about the energy future. Because you know, when, when, the, you, when, when Bush was planning to go into Iraq and there were debates about it in the United States, uh, Rupert Murdoch, who had founded Fox Cable News to try to push the US uh, to the right, uh, gave an interview in which he said, well, y you won't be questioning this war when you see the $14 a barrel petroleum that comes out of it. So they thought they were going to just flood the market. They were going to put so much petroleum on the market, there would be plenty to go around for the US corporate sector, and also they would keep the price uh, low and reasonable so as to forestall uh, the rise of green energy. Uh, and at the same time, they were pursuing a deliberate policy, both the Bush administration and the, uh, the corporate uh, uh, energy sector of uh, climate denialism and trying to pull the wool over Americans' eyes, even though their own scientists were telling them exactly what was going to happen. Uh, and so um, I think that all of those uh, chickens that were released in the, in the Bush era, then now in the past 13 years have come to roost. Come to roost. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this leads me to a question for, for you, Randa, because uh, one of those chickens you could say that came home to roost as a result of the invasion was um, the rise of ISIS. And, and you said, you know, in your talk just now about how, you know, the Middle East keeps pulling you in. Obama wanted to pivot away, and then he gets pulled back in. Um, to what degree would that pull back in have happened elsewhere in the Middle East if it hadn't been for the reasons that you described? Is this something that is going to keep pulling the U.S. back? Is, sorry, is this region somewhere that's going to be, the U.S. is going to be, regularly pulled back in for reasons related to the legacy of the invasion of Iraq or else, or, or otherwise? I, I mean, I got Flint's point and the, uh, Trita's point is that, uh, I mean, the natural conclusion from their remarks is that there, the region, I mean, the US will continue to be pulled in. However, I think if you look right today at the polling, for example, um, I don't see any presidential candidate or any congressional candidate, be it in the Senate or you know, in the House, winning any coup de points, talking about foreign policy writ large, and more so about the Middle East. You know? I mean, there is this big debate now in the US whether the US forces will stay in the Northeast Syria or not. I'm willing to bet the next administration be it another Biden administration or a Trump administration, is going to pull out of Northeast Syria. I mean, the writing is on the wall. Uh, but, but even that, you know, which is pulling forces out, I mean, if somebody talks about it, he's not going to get any coup de points. And that's why I think any president uh, going forward, uh, again, Biden, Trump, is going to find it very hard to make the case for an intervention in the Middle East, unless security, unless interest 
that 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 can be translated to a voter in Ohio or a voter in Pennsylvania or a voter in Iowa uh, are are well articulated. And I have to say, the, until today, I have to say that none, whether it's the Iraq war, Afghanistan, to some extent, yes, but. I think that case has never been strongly made over the years. And, and add to that that the country today, because of the Iraq war, and that's one impact I want to talk about, is this hyper-partisanship inside the country about uh, in the political arena, you know? And, and it used to be that there was this old adage, politics stops at the water edge, right? And Iraq war ended that. And w politics starts, stops at the water edge mean that we Republicans and Democrats can fight as much as we can on domestic issues, but we should not let our disputes seep into the foreign policy arena and the national security arena. This is no longer the case. In fact, how Iraq, I mean, Iraq was used by Republicans in the 2002 military election as a wedge issue. It was used again by the Democrat in 2006 as a, as a partisan wedge issue. The Benghazi attack was used in 2012, you know. 2014-2017 uh, uh, litigation of that era was used again by, by Republicans and by, uh, by... So I think the combination of both, the impact of Iraq, the lasting impact of Iraq on, on, on the domestic political scene, as well as the lack, in my opinion, of any president, any candidate in the future to make a strong case for an intervention in Syria, given, given, the, given the reason that Juan talked about, is that what were the organizing principles driving us into the Middle East? Although I have to say, you know, Obama's organizing principle in the Middle East was don't do stupid shit. And there was, <laughs> that was a big uh, debate between him and Hillary about that. But anyway, I'll stop here. Okay. Could I add a couple of yeah, things? Please, uh, I, yeah, I think uh, Rana is quite right. Uh, we've done plenty of polling on this issue, um, and it's very clear that the American public has very little appetite for more interventions. But what it's really about is American body bags coming home. So the interventions you may see, if there is another ISIS, for instance, in the region, is going to be more similar to what Obama did in Yemen, which a lot of drone strikes, a lot of different things that really minimizes the risk of any American casualties. It's the same thing you're seeing in Ukraine. The United States is extremely in support of Ukraine, but from the very beginning, the president said a red line, no American troops. Had there been American troops coming home from Ukraine in body bags, the support for that effort would have collapsed very, very quickly, I suspect. Yeah. Our poll uh, just recently last week on Saudi-Israeli normalization also showed that both independents, Republicans, and Democrats, a majority of them, oppose any normalization that has an American security guarantee to Riyadh. I suspect those numbers would have been even higher if that poll had been done a year ago or two years ago when there was still fresh memory of Americans coming home in body bags from Afghanistan. That memory has started to fade the support is still very limited, but not, the opposition is not as intense as I think it would have been two years ago. Thank you. Um, one last question before I turn it to questions from the, from the audience. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Flint, but also, Trudeau, you mentioned this in, in your talk as well. I want to hear a bit more about Israel-Palestine. You very briefly, Flint, in your comments said that, among other things, one result of this has been the death of the two-state solution. I wonder if you could expand on that, and maybe, Trudy, if you could, could talk a little bit about what you were uh, saying earlier, and, and again, just now about Saudi-Israeli normalization, as both an impact of, a legacy of Iraq. Um, please. Um, yeah, I think the two-state solution is dead. That formulation suggests that at some point in the past, there was a real possibility of that, um, frankly, reflecting on my work on that issue in government service, I'm very, I get increasingly skeptical that there ever was a viable two-state solution, that whatever Israel would be prepared to offer on the issues at the, at the heart of a potential settlement wouldn't be enough for um, 
uh, to satisfy Palestinian minimums. And I think at this point, you've had such a, a right word turn in Israeli politics, and it just keeps getting further right the more time elapses. Um, I think the only way this issue ultimately gets resolved, and I suspect it will be a long, uh, at times bloody and very, very difficult process, is basically at some point uh, Palestinians themselves are going to realize they're not going to get a two-state solution and they will start to organize around, um, around a one-state solution in effect. And Israel and Israel's friends in the United States will get to argue why one person, one vote is a good idea everywhere in the world except where Palestinians live. Yeah, this is one of those issues. I don't know if there's any other example of something having been dead for more, almost 20 years, but we still kind of pretend that it's still alive. The Israelis have been very open that the two-state solution is not something they're pursuing. They're pursuing a de facto annexation. The United States, in the conversations about normalization, the Palestinians asked for a UN recognition of a Palestinian state, a membership, and the United States said no, that that is not even in the cards. So, uh, yeah, certainly does not appear that this type of a process will lead to anything. And the mantra of the administration on Ukraine has been nothing about Ukraine without the Ukrainians. On this issue, it seems like everything about Palestine without any Palestinians. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll shift now to questions from the audience. And again, if you are interested in sending one in, remember there's the, the QR code on your, on your tables. This question comes from John, a GUQ student. With the US's pivot to China, and with China's increasing involvement in the Middle East, do you think that we would see more rather than less US involvement in the future? And the reason I picked this question first is because everyone seems to be in agreement that the US is, is in a weaker position, but maybe it's the great power politics, as John points out, with China that will cause the US to have to, you know, as you put it before, Rana, get pulled back into the region. So would you like to go first? I mean, uh, let me also basically qualify this pivot, okay? This is not disengagement from the Middle East. This is not withdrawal from the Middle East. The economic, military, political, intelligence footprint of the United States in the Middle East remains quite impressive. And it's not going to be, you know, reduced dramatically anytime soon. So let's, let's put this out. And I think, you know, China, uh, I, I, I was in a, in, a, in a room where I think a, uh, an expert on China was saying, and I tend to agree with that position, China's interest in this region remains primarily economic. And, and it's not interested in playing a security role. It's not interested in providing any kind of uh, security umbrella. Uh, uh, it's, in fact, free riding on the US security umbrella in one way or another. So uh, uh, I, I don't see we have to worry about this kind of withdrawal. Or There is a pivot, yes. There is deprioritization of the Middle East in, in, US, in uh, US administrations. Yes, there is less time being spent by the president, the vice president, uh, cabinet uh, officials, uh, military on the Middle East, yes. But it doesn't mean that it's still not an important, you know, uh, involvement and, and uh, uh, commitment. Can I just one quick thing. Um, I agree with the student, and I would have to say, I think, from the regional perspective, this should be quite concerning. In the first year of the administration, as you all may remember, there was supposed to be a force um, posture audit by uh, General Austin, uh, Secretary of Defense Austin. The original draft of it talked about vacating 19, uh, 17 out of 19 bases in the Middle East. That ended up changing. Uh, somewhat towards the end of the summer. And the winning argument was that the real competition is with China, and competition with China is not going to take place in South China Sea. It's going to be global. It's going to happen in Europe, in Africa, Latin America, in the Middle East. And as a result, 
the Middle East in some ways was given a higher priority, or at least was shifting towards a higher priority, but not for the sake of the Middle East, for the sake of the competition with China. So the securitization or resecuritization of the region uh, in this Cold War context, I have a hard time seeing how that ultimately be, will be beneficial for the region. Yeah, and on, on that treaty, just look at when, before Obama made the trip to Saudi Arabia last summer, he wrote an op-ed in the Washington, uh, Biden, excuse me, uh, but President Biden writes this op-ed in the Washington Post, literally, why am I going to Saudi Arabia? And it was all about China and to a lesser degree Russia and not leaving, as he put it, a vacuum in the Middle East for China to fill. But also the region today is not the region that it was before. I mean, let's you know, say that the region has agencies. Countries in the region have agencies. And, and you know, whether, it's, uh, whether they're going to be used as pawns in, 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 in this strategic power competition is, is not something that they are willing to entertain. And we have seen how they have been approaching both the United States, China, Russia, everything. So I think there is a lot of agency now that the countries of the region basically are, 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 full, are you know, working under and, and, and fulfilling. And uh, I don't see that kind of uh, great power competition uh, proceeding uh, with their acquiescence uh, going forward. Can I yep, just say please. That, um, the American naval theorist of the 19th century, uh, Mahon, uh, Alfred Thayer Mahon, uh, said that if you want to be a great world naval power, you have to have the Straits of Molokka, uh, the, the Straits of Hormuz, and uh, uh, the Bab el Mandeb. The U.S. is a great world naval power. And it has all three. And it's not giving them up. Exactly. So the, um, the and, and the Chinese now have three aircraft carrier battle groups, which is extremely alarming in Washington. They keep asking the Chinese, why do you want those? What are you going to do with them? Uh, and so I think that uh, when I said that the US, that, that the Middle East will be diminished for the United States. I think the aspirations to be a regional hegemon will decline. Yes. Uh, I think that concern, well, why, why is the Fifth Fleet in, uh, has its headquarters in Manama? It's because so much of the world's petroleum and now to some extent natural gas comes out of the, uh, out of the Gulf. But, um, that won't be the concern, but there will still be markets. There will still be competition for those markets. There will still be geopolitical competition. So I didn't mean to uh, say that the U.S. won't be concerned with the region at all, and certainly it will be concerned with transportation routes. I mean, the Suez Canal is not going to not be important. But um, I think it will be a different relationship than we saw at the height of, uh, say, the, uh, the Bush era, where the U.S. was the sole hyperpower, and it, it was actually coming in and acting in a Napoleonic way of reshaping the region, putting boots on the ground. And even when we say that Obama got pulled back in, uh, he, he only deployed air power and uh, was only willing to be pulled in to the extent that he could use air power. And if, it hadn't been, uh, if there hadn't been a willingness of Iraq to reconstitute its army and take Mosul on the ground, and if he hadn't found partners in Syria and the form of the Kurds and some of the Arab tribes to take on ISIL in Raqqa, uh, th th those bombing campaigns would have been useless. But he was not willing to cross that line, and I think the, the likelihood of a future president crossing that line is low. And also the Middle East really is, of all the areas of competition between China and the U.S., is the one that lends itself to the cooperation between the United States and China. We share a lot, I mean, we have a lot of overlapping interests in the Middle East. We share interest in, you know, uh, nuclear, non, in, in non-proliferation. We share interest in stability. We share interest in fighting terrorist group, although we define terrorism differently or terrorist group differently. But we ha it is an area where, in fact, it can lend itself to cooperation between the two countries much more than any other part of the world. At least, I'm always thinking about ways for countries to cooperate and less to compete. 
All right. A question now to bring us back, focused very much on Iraq itself. How can, this is a question from Anonymous, how can the US build a stronger bilateral relationship with Iraq in the future, given all the context we've been talking about today, knowing the regional, ri excuse me, rising regional influence of Iran, the more, what do you want to call it, conservative, what do you want to call it, um, cautious approach to US foreign policy, whether we want to bring China into the, into the equation, the, the US-Iraq relationship going forward. Yep, Juan? Well, um, I believe that I can predict what President Biden would say about this, uh, if you asked him, uh, which is that the next era uh, in, in world history is going to be the global energy transition uh, to green energy on the one hand, and the institution of robust uh, systems of resilience for combating the ill effects of climate change on the other. And one of the things that the US is going to be able to offer countries be precisely because of the IRA, and I'm looking forward, but the United States is going to become a major producer of green energy, uh, solar panels, turbines, batteries, new battery technology, and some of these things are going to become incredibly inexpensive, and the purveyor prevail of them to these regions so that they can uh, cut their own carbon footprint uh, is going to be very important. And the United States is also going to have to ramp up, if we, as we have seen uh, in, in, in just uh, this past summer, uh, resilience programs. How do coastal areas deal with uh, rising seas? That's going to affect a lot of, of Iraq uh, in the south. Uh, like from yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. And, uh, uh, how, how do you deal with the increasing drought and uh, dryness and, and water shortages? The, the, as President Sala said, uh, the extra evaporation that you're going to see from bodies of water. Uh, well, the U United States also is going to have the same problems and it has a lot of really good engineers. And, uh, and Biden is attempting, uh, along with allies in the progressive side of the Democratic caucus, to. Um, uh, to reposition the United States as a leader on these issues. And I think it's something that is going to offer places like Iraq uh, and, and uh, will be uh, a much better offer uh, than the one that has traditionally been made of the United States to supply arms to these countries. I think the Biden administration is the first administration since the Iraq invasion that's really trying to move the relationship with Iraq into what we call a normal bilateral relationship. I mean, there has been recently mill-to-mill -mill delegations, uh, uh, focusing really on different aspects of the relationship beyond the security and military aspects, uh, academic exchanges, uh, culture, climate change. Uh, and, and I agree with, uh, with one that I think there is a potential. But of all, I mean, since the Iraq war, uh, I think it's the first one that's starting to move. And I think the bureaucracy itself is starting to move toward, you know, ways of making the relationship, the bilateral relationship, a normal relationship. Well, on that note, please join me in thanking our panelists for really a fantastic concluding and uh, closing plenary. Uh, before I do my closing remarks, I just want to go back to a question uh, that Eddie, you asked. Um, which had to do with, uh, with Palestine. And the reason I want to do this, because I have a couple of things to say about that, and because we have, there's another anniversary, uh, maybe that's not as widely known, uh, but it takes place exactly a week from today, on the 23rd of September, 2003, uh, the great Edward Said passed away. And uh, in one week, uh, it'll be the 20th anniversary of his death. Um, the two-state solution, I think, has been dead for a very, very long time. And uh, he, Edward, was one of the proponents of a one state. And today what we have is one state. It's not a solution, but it's reality. It's a one state reality. Um, and the only people that I think would benefit from a two-state solution is the Palestinian Authority. But increasingly, young Palestinians are 
past geography. Increasingly, I find at least, that young Palestinians in Ramallah and elsewhere, they want rights. They want economic rights, first and foremost. They want dignity. And so for them, belonging to a one state, call it whatever you want to call it, is far more important um, than having um, a statehood the way that uh, we normally uh, think of that. So I just wanted to go back to that and say it. Um, I want to really make my remarks as brief as possible and to start off by thanking um, a number of people. First of all, thanking you, the participant and attendees, for accepting our invitation for coming here. I mean, just this panel, um, everybody who was on that panel uh, flew uh, thousands of miles to be with us today and to share um, their incredible insights. So my first thanks on behalf of Georgetown University in Qatar is to all of you um, who have come from all over the world or from all over the region or from down the street here in Doha to be with us over the past three days. So thank you. A big thank you to all of you. <laughs> Next, I'd like Zahra to stand up and be properly recognized for all the great efforts that she has put into this. And I'd like you to stay standing while Liz, Susie, Misbah, and Maram from the Center for International Regional Studies also stand up and be recognized. <laughs> and I want you all to stay standing while Maha Oredi stands up. Where is Maha? Thank you. Thank you. And thanks also go to a lot of people. I mean, too many to mention by name and to recognize by asking them to stand up. But uh, from the events team and Danielle in particular, the communications team, uh, Muammar, Walid, Nahla, and Raqiya, you've seen them uh, around uh, over the past couple of days. They've all done an incredible job. I want to thank Eddie. Uh, for having helped give birth to this concept um, of having this uh, uh, this conference, and you know we we've envisioned it back in April, um, and we all know any of us who have been org involved in organizing conferences, you need a 12-month lead time. Um, but with Zahra and with the team, they were able to pull it off, and uh, my faculty and administrative colleagues really for. Uh, having done everything that they could. So, you know, I was thinking this morning, how does one close a conference like this? How do you try to capture the richness of the discussions um, in a few minutes? You can't, but I'm still going to try. Um, I guess the greatest sign of success has been that you're all here. You're all here at the end of the conference on a Saturday afternoon. Um, it is also um, a sign that most of the panels, the parallel uh, discussions that have taken place have had standing room only uh, in the rooms. Um, it's also a sign that former President Barham Saleh didn't just give his keynote and leave on Thursday night. Before he went back to uh, Suleimani last night, he came and attended a few sessions. He figured there are a few things that he could learn as former president by listening to the discussions. Uh, another sign is that the UK ambassador um, is back with us this afternoon um, with his wife, who is also a former uh, US diplomat, um, here with us. I think that today and in the days ahead, we will reflect on what we heard and learned here. And that is really the point of Hiwarat. Um, it is to inform, to exchange ideas and knowledge, to listen, uh, to share penetrating insights, to discuss and debate, and to connect, to connect with one another and to connect with ideas. And I've benefited tremendously from connecting, from listening to ideas, from having the opportunity to reflect, and from connecting with people, many of whom I had not met before, and uh, many whom I knew and had a great chance to connect with here. 
uh, much of the benefit, I think, of coming together for something like this takes place not only in the boardroom and in the various meeting rooms, but in the hallways and over lunch. And it's been really rewarding to witness how many great conversations seem to have been going on. So the dialogue doesn't end here when we finish this uh, conference. It begins now. It really starts at this moment. Um, and I've, as I've been asked by many, some of you, some in the media, about Hiwarat and explaining it and so on and so forth, um, and what is the objective of it. And really, the objective, I think, has been met. The objective has been to provide a platform for these kinds of discussions <coughs> that otherwise we wouldn't have been able to have. Um, Conversations like this really, and I said this on Thursday, could not uh, have been had elsewhere, okay? They haven't been taking place elsewhere. We heard from Ayman Muhyiddin about how no one wants to talk about Iraq, <laughs> okay. or Afghanistan for that matter, and how difficult it has been for him as a TV host and for others um, to have anybody come in and talk about it. Um, and even if they could, that kind of conversation has a very different air about it, has a very different nature to it when you have it in the region, when you have it in the neighborhood. Not only because you're able to attract a lot of people from the region, from, in this case, Iraq and, uh, and the neighborhood overall, but just the nature of the conversation when you're in it is very different than when you're thousands of miles away from it. I think we've been very, very fortunate in that we had access that hasn't been granted anywhere else. So to have you, um, Ambassador Wilkes, to have had uh, Ambassador Davis, uh, to have had the former president of, uh, uh, of Iraq, but in particular to have the UK and US ambassadors you know, be here and be in the uh, difficult position of representing their countries, but also being very frank um, and, and personal um, in recounting their experiences is, um, is really um, a terrific thing that I do not take for granted. To have experts, I mean, we've heard from them um, today, and we've heard from them over the past couple of days, practitioners and academics um, is great. One of the things that really left a mark with me, I don't know if uh, Ala Talabani is still here in the room, uh, sorry? Yeah, okay. Uh, when you said a couple of times that what's really different about this is that you have conversations. You have them in Baghdad, you have them in Slimania, you have them in Basra, but you're all talking to one another, right? And uh, to me, um, having this interaction for our Iraqi friends and our Iraqi colleagues has been incredibly valuable. Um, uh, and so, you know, I want to I wanna say that. Um, now, I've also been asked, okay, the Hiwarat series sounds like a great idea. We think it's a great idea. And I think, to, you know, this, this weekend has really proven to be a great kickoff for it. But why start with Iraq? Um, something that I had taken perhaps for granted, but perhaps, um, you know, thinking, reflecting on it as a result of the question. Uh, one, because Iraq is important. And what happens in Iraq and what has happened in Iraq is important not only for Iraq, it's important for the region, it's important for the world. And it has had, as we've heard, um, including most recently on this panel, uh, ramifications for uh, US as well as other international diplomatic relations in the region and everywhere. Uh, so the impact in the region and the world is very, very important. And the anniversary is very important. Um, and, you know, let's sort of, just in terms of recapping, as I've reflected on some of the takeaways, and these will evolve and develop for all of us over the next few days as we reflect on it. Uh, we've learned a lot about sort of who won, <laughs> uh, whether it was Iran uh, being the biggest winner, Israel, we didn't talk about Israel as much, perhaps. Uh, uh, who lost? I mean, obviously, the biggest loser is Iraq. Uh, you know, who won, why, and who lost, and why, and what are the implications for the future? Um, I found one of the most uh, rewarding and informative, but also 
difficult and saddest uh, sessions that I've attended was one about women uh, in Iraq and uh, hearing really about the uh, rollback of many of the rights of women, human rights, um, over the past 20 years. Um, there are many, many problems that face Iraq today that have resulted from political decisions, from actions, from uh, the invasion and, um, and the occupation. Um, and some of them are just ongoing problems that uh, need to be attended to. Environment, we've heard a lot about that. The economy, um, again, some of the panel discussions have pointed to how so many countries in the region are in dire economic straits in that part of this broader region. Um, during yesterday's panel um, on the neighborhood, on the Levant, it was noted how the crises in Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria were vastly different, yet produced similarly devastating outcomes. Uh, I think the discussions we've had around security, which we have to deal with for a long time to come, have also been very eye-opening. Um, the fact that uh, it's reported that in, in Idlib alone, uh, there are around 25,000 armed fighters. Um, you know, where is that energy going to go? Where is the energy that is now um, probably going to be brewing in refugee camps in Syria? Um, where is that, you know, that kind of radicalization that takes place in that kind of environment? what impact will have that on the region and on the world in the years and decades to come. Uh, yes, Daesh is gone, but the ideas behind Daesh may not be, may not be gone. Uh, all of these issues are transnational, and the, the, uh, they transcend beyond Iraq's border. Uh, what I thought was really, really helpful is to also uh, discuss the role of the U.S. in the region and in the world. Um, Flint, you pointed to uh, this is an imperial overstretch uh, by uh, the United States, the invasion of uh, Iraq, that is. Uh, Juan, you talked about the eroding influence and the um, sort of receding interest in the region on the part of the United States. I love, Trent, as you're uh, sort of invoking uh, the image of Obama as the godfather. Um, you know, will the U.S. continue to be pulled back into the region? Probably. Uh, but also the U.S. is necessarily focused on a lot of domest domestic issues, political dysfunction and divisions and so on. There's also fatigue, as Trita reminded us. Um, but I do think, as also Flint reminded us, the U.S. is becoming less and less relevant and reliable in the region. Um, Vali Nasser pointed out yesterday that the Middle East, when we were in school uh, and early in our careers, used to mean Israel-Palestine. You know, when you would face a very difficult challenge, you would say it's easier to solve the Middle East problem. When you talked about the Middle East problem, you were not referring to Iraq. You were referring to, um, to the Palestinian um, issue. But I think what has happened over the past two, three decades as the centers of gravity in the region we call the Middle East have shifted from Baghdad, Cairo, Damascus, the centers of gravity of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, they've shifted. They're now Doha, Abu Dhabi, Riyadh. Um, the, uh, part, this part of the world doesn't wait for instructions from the U.S. as it once did. Um, there are far more confident leaders who are playing the field, looking for their best interests, uh, calling the shots and fixing on problems. Um, not because the U.S., by the way, has abandoned the region, uh, but for a lot of other reasons that have brought about this kind of confidence and this kind of ability to play in the global, um, in the global arena. Um, and we saw that. I mean, <coughs> I think Flint talked about the uh, Biden's visit to the uh, South, to Saudi Arabia. Um, it wasn't only an ill-prepared visit, but also, you know, Saudi Arabia played America and played Biden in a way that it wouldn't have imagined doing um, a decade or two, two before. There's, of course, Europe's relationship with the region and the role of Russia and China in the new global 
order. Uh, one theme that came across again and again is that democracy cannot be promoted through the barrel of a gun. Doing so proved tragically, um, horribly, devastatingly uh, fallacious. And, but as, as Juan uh, reminded us also, uh, this really wasn't about promoting democracy. Uh, this was about oil and about a lot of other uh, things. But to the extent that it was about promoting democracy, uh, there is not one model for democracy, and it is uh, uh, not just electoral democracy. Uh, so today we might have electoral democracy in Iraq, uh, perhaps as corrupt as the system might be, um, and the U.S. may be credited with bringing electoral democracy to Iraq, um, but not economic rights, uh, for example, and other, uh, other forms of, of democracy. Um, let me just sort of you know, begin to conclude by re-emphasizing uh, why it is so important that we spent the past three days talking about Iraq. Uh, Iraq is a great nation. Uh, as Barham Saleh uh, told me privately, but I asked him if I could share it. He said, you know, it's a great nation, failed state. And then he corrected himself and he said, failing state. And so I hope that one of the outcomes of conversations like the ones we have been having uh, is how to prevent it from fully failing. I mean, Iraq is a great nation. It is the cradle of civilizations. Um, it has, uh, you know, in, in, uh, you know, from the time that the seat of the Abbasid uh, dynasty uh, was established there in the eighth century, and Baghdad was created, and then the House of Wisdom. Um, which produced so much knowledge um, that we benefit from uh, today. And it was destroyed by the Mongols in 1258, right? And it rebuilt itself. And um, I think we all share the hope over the past three days that there will be a rebuilding. As one young Iraqi said yesterday, um, Rashab from, uh, I think, you know, a new line, uh, she said, Iraq must work. Iraq must work. It's not an option uh, for it um, to fail. Uh, the graduates that are the students who will become graduates, whom we will send into the world, will be the ones who will clean up the messes that uh, have been created. Um, they will steer the region and uh, become its stewards and its conscience. And so we're relying on you. Uh, what they're learning here, I think one of the great benefits of the past three days has been the exposure uh, to our students of the ideas that have been uh, presented to them. Now let me conclude by saying this is just the beginning. Um, I really hope and trust that everybody enjoyed the interaction, enjoyed being here, uh, that you will come back uh, in the weeks and months ahead. We'll delve into the history of Islamophobia, the continuing challenges concerning Afghanistan, the future of water security in the Gulf, and the social and cultural dynamics shaping the global energy landscape. Um, and I don't know where this will go also. I mean, I hope that uh, projects will come out of this, that uh, connections that have been formed over the past couple of days, as I said, with ideas and with people will lead to other things, and maybe we'll come back here um, to talk about other dimensions of uh, Iraq as it uh, hopefully, um, you know, rebuilds and rebuilds quickly over the uh, years to come. So with that, again, I cannot tell you how delighted we all are at Georgetown University in Qatar to have hosted this, um, to have had all of you participate in it, and um, thank you very much. And for those of you who are traveling, we wish you safe travels back home and hope to see you again soon. Thank you.